We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. Hey everybody, it's Steve with Census Fidelium, and here is that uh, little bit more of that call to action. I want to give a little bit of an update of what's going on in North Carolina. If you probably know that I live in, I don't live in the mountains, but live outside, you know, west of Charlotte. And obviously the storm came through our area, uh, knocked out power north and south of us for, I think they were out of power for four or five days. Obviously not as bad as what these guys had, but going to have uh, some links about what's going on up there right now, some links that you probably haven't seen that are just floating around on uh, sh social media, TikTok, things like that, and other secular sites or, or uh, accounts. And uh, basically, hopefully, just to get you to uh, send more clothes, send more supplies to the people. I have a link at the end and underneath in the show notes where you can do that directly to the parishes. But uh, here's a little... Just to give you a start of, here's the past. There is, you might have seen the sign of the 1916 flood that got knocked over in Asheville. Here's a little bit more about what happened in 1916. Take a look, a sneak peek from the new 1916 flood documentary. Devastating storms caused death and destruction across western North Carolina. Well, tonight the filmmaker and local experts talk about that epic weather event at a sold-out event at Blue Ridge Community College. News 13's John Lee tells us why the filmmaker says that time in history is still relevant today. It almost looked like Asheville had become Venice. 1916 may seem like ancient history. It's amazing, you know, people are always dressed up even in the middle of a flood. Woodrow Wilson was president then. The uh, French Broad River was actually almost a mile wide. So people are just standing out there and, and looking at um, their new neighborhood. But the whisper of history speaks to filmmaker David Weintraub. The city of Hendersonville itself was an island uh, surrounded by water. It looks like there's a dam back there, doesn't it? Weintraub is executive director of the Center for Cultural Preservation in Hendersonville. Can you imagine if you had that same situation today, 300 mudslides and rock slides with all the subdivisions up on the nice beautiful views? You know, those houses are just um, sleds waiting to happen. In July, nearly a century ago... I believe this is Bat Cave. Western North Carolina was swamped after 10 days of rain. Two hurricanes slammed the southeast in short order, and the mountains were hit hard. This is the worst in the natural disaster in Western North Carolina, yeah. In one 24-hour period, almost two feet of rain. This is a shot of workmen on a bridge, apparently holding on for dear life. Weintraub's collected hundreds of photos for a documentary called Come Hell or High Water. Raging rivers overflowed their banks, and the floods were described as the worst in years. He hopes the film starts a conversation. And the flood teaches us so many lessons about how to live, where to live, um, how to live our lives in a sustainable way. Lessons from generations past that are often overlooked. There's certain places in western North Carolina that the elders say, you should not be living there. In Hendersonville. What's the point of history if we can't apply the lessons that history teaches us? John Lee, News 13. Here's the link if you want to see it. It's uh, I'll have it underneath the show notes if you want to try to get the film or uh, look more into it. Here's uh, the Stories of Appalachia podcast, uh, The Great Flood of 1960. Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome in to another episode of Stories. I'm Steve Gilley along with Rod Mullins. And today we're going to tell you a story of flooding throughout Southern Appalachia, particularly in Western North Carolina. You're listening to Stories by History of Appalachia. You 
You know, Steve, there's been a lot of big floods over the years. I remember the big flood of 1977. That was one big one that I'll never soon forget. But, you know, there's been so many of them. And this one really dropped me when I first found out about it. And it occurs a little bit more south from where our region is here in the, the central part of Appalachia, per se, of the Kingsport and the Wise County and southwest Virginia area. But still, this made a big impact on the Appalachian region. Yeah, and it made a little bit of an impact on some local history in the place where we live, but we'll tell you about that at the end of this podcast. Well, the summer of 1916 seemed like any other in the mountains of western North Carolina. Then on July 5th, a Category 3 hurricane hit the Gulf Coast at the Alabama-Florida state line, making it the earliest major hurricane to make landfall in U.S. history at that time. Well, the hurricane headed north into Appalachia, dropping heavy rainfall over North Carolina by July 7th. And then the storm stalled, continuing to dump water on the mountains for seven straight days. Well, that was bad enough, but it was about to get much, much worse, wasn't it, Rod? Yes, it was, Steve, because on July 14th, another hurricane hit the United States, this time at Charleston, South Carolina, then headed northeast into the same mountains on that same track that had been enduring heavy rain from the first storm for a week. Rivers were at flood stage when the second storm hit, and with nowhere to go, the water from the second hurricane poured into rivers already overflowing their banks. The French Broad River crested at 21 feet, 17 feet above flood stage. The river had expanded from its usual 381 feet across at Asheville to go to an incredible 1,500 feet across. That is a third of a mile. That is Mm. one big stretch of flood water. Well, by Sunday, July 16th, dams were bursting all over western North Carolina. And as you'd expect, houses, bridges, and train trestles were washed away. The mountains of North Carolina were cut off from the rest of the world. Mud was also a problem as waterlogged hills gave way, sending dirt sliding into the raging floodwaters. One survivor described the roar of a mudslide as it rushed past his home, taking off the back porch, then the entire house. Linville Falls, 50 miles northeast of Asheville, saw a landslide that destroyed a house. Even though everybody in that home escaped, they had to run to get away. And, and Rod, get this, one of the women had been awoken by the slide and jumped out of bed, then ran to a neighbor's house about a mile away wearing what she could grab, two aprons, one tied around the front, the other one tied around the back. Wow. She didn't have long to be able to grab something to be able to get out of there and go. This was just this, this quick. It just moved this quick. Yeah. Well, the effects of the flooding were devastating. Biltmore, as well as other sections of Buncombe County, were surrounded by a floodwater lake. In fact, waters reached a height of nine feet at the gates of the mansion. Now, you got to picture Biltmore. Biltmore is setting alone like an island surrounded by this huge amount of flood water, almost mm-hmm. like a castle being surrounded by a moat. Yeah. So, I mean, that's hard to believe. 300 mudslides were reported in Asheville alone. Now, the Virginia Creeper Railroad, which was located where the Virginia Creeper Trail is now, sustained major damage in the 1916 flood. Just one year after the line was completed to Elkland, North Carolina, The flooding wiped out nearly all of its tracks and trestles, which had to be rebuilt. The river flooding was so swift that motorists in Asheville were caught by surprise and had to abandon their automobiles in the middle of the road to escape the rising waters. People were clinging to trees to keep from being drowned. There were reports of cows being swept downstream into the floodwaters. Oh, wow. Well, another story is of a railroad bridge north of Belmont which was in constant use as freight trains made their way north, loaded with peaches and other produce. Railroad workers stayed on the job, removing debris that was being deposited on the bridge supports to make it safe for those trains to keep running. They'd work to clear the bridge, then jump off the tracks when the next train arrived, then get back on the bridge to continue their unending work. Then around 5.30 that evening, the bridge finally gave way to the floodwaters just as a train full of peaches crossed. The 19 men on the bridge were deposited in the raging river below. Some drowned, some crushed by the falling bridge. Of the 19, 10 were killed. Marshall, North Carolina was especially hard hit. The county seat of Madison County 
lies between the French Broad River and hills on a narrow strip of land sitting about 10 to 12 feet above normal river levels. In July of 1916, all but three buildings were covered with water. Many homes were washed away. Two rail bridges were destroyed and a large section of the Southern Railway track were ripped from the ground by the flood. The waters rose from two feet to more than 20 feet in 16 hours, covering Main Street to a depth of five feet, racing along at five feet per second down the street. Shortly after noon, houses began to come off their foundations and began to float down the river. And Steve, if you really want to get an idea of what something like this was like, I'm sure people could go to YouTube and see these videos that they have captured of mm -hmm. mud and water coming down these hillsides or coming down in certain areas because it is hard to believe that even though the water was five feet deep, it was racing at five feet per second down the street and that's fast yeah and if you've never been to marshall north carolina you, you've got to picture in your mind this place that's kind of like a there's a curve that goes through the middle of town the river's on one side there's a mountain on the other side and all the buildings are right along that narrow strip so when the water comes up there's no place to go right except downstream and that's exactly what happened wow well, a resident of Watauga County, Andrew Jackson Green, kept a diary most of his life, and he made several entries detailing the flood and its effects on Boone and Watauga County. July 9. This is a day to be long remembered. I don't believe that the rain has ceased during this entire day. A part of the time, it rained real hard. The waters are flush, and they are likely to get worse. It has been a long time since I have seen so much rain in one day. July 14. Just at night, it commences to rain. The wind blows and it becomes a very gloomy time. The storm increases in fury. The wind rages so that I cannot sleep very well. And then the second hurricane arrived. July 15. The rain continues this morning. The wind is high. This is the most terrific storm that I have seen in a long time. The waters rise and much damage is done. The power plant has been damaged very much. The general destruction is awful. The entire day is spent in great anxiety. I think of the great distress that many people are in. July 15. In the evening, the news comes that one of the Cone Lakes has burst. It comes down Winkler's Creek and brings everything before it. Large trees, logs, debris in general, are deposited in the bottom of the new river. Some of the older inhabitants say that the water has not been so high since 1889. The rain continued steadily for more than 36 hours. Two houses were carried away in that dam break, as well as a bridge and a mill. July 17. Boone is cut off from communication with the outside world. We dread to hear what the real conditions are. We hear many flying reports, but do not know just how much credit to give them. Well, the Watauga Democrat newspaper reported that the storms did $200,000 worth of damage to the county, or $4.4 million in 2017 dollars. The heaviest rainfall in the flood was recorded at Alta Pass near Grandfather Mountain on the Mitchell-Avery County line, which Rod received 22 Point two two inches of rain in the 24 hours of July 15th through the 16th. A record. Can you believe wow. that? Well, and we've thought about it too. Of course, the hurricane that went through Houston and down there in, in mm -hmm. southern Texas, and they got as much as 25, 30 inches of rain or more. But you got to take into consideration, this is 22 inches of rain in the mountains and when it falls off the mountains it's going to go immediately to the lowest point that it can it's going yeah. to run down the mountains like crazy whereas in houston it's mostly all flat and it's just going to stay there and keep on coming in regardless so, yeah. so it was it was rough yeah so you either a have a lake that you have to find a boat to get around in or b you get washed away with mud rocks and, and other debris exactly not a great choice in my opinion yeah mm -mm. Anyway, in the end, the 1916 double punch became the deadliest and most costly natural disaster in North Carolina history. In all, 80 people died, 
and $481 million in damage was done in 2017 dollars. And a side note, nothing major here, but this does explain something that we talked about in one of our first podcasts. This flooding during the summer of 1916 affected East Tennessee as well and placed the town of Irwin on the map, but not in the way they might have wanted, did it, Rod? No, Steve, because due to the flooding, the Clinchfield Railroad was kept busy for months afterward repairing rail lines. And to do the repairs, they needed as many of their crane derricks as they could get in order to pick up cars that had derailed in the flooding as well as to lift heavy replacement rails out to men working the repair lines. As a result, in September, when a circus elephant named who, Steve? Mary. Well, she killed a circus worker in Kingsport, Tennessee, and angry residents of the new city wanted the elephant hung with the blessings of the circus owner who smelled free publicity in that. So there were no derricks available to come to Kingsport to do the hanging. So the elephant was then transported to the rail yards at Irwin, which had the only available derrick car. And that's why Irwin is known as the place they hung the elephant. That was an interesting little side note. You know, we talked about the hanging of Mary the Elephant in one of our first podcasts. And there was talk about there was repair work being done, but it was this flood that caused the repair work that was necessary, which kept the derricks away, which meant they had to go down to the main Clinchfield line there in Irwin in order to be able to hang the elephant. And, you know, and I know there's a lot of ifs here, but if the hurricane or both hurricanes had not collided and and kind of bunched up on top of each other Mm -hmm. and all of this rain, there might not have been any Derrick cars or anything in Irwin at the time for all of this stuff going on. And how would they have been able to do anything with Mary the Elephant? It, it leaves some questions there to be asked. What, what could have been if that was the case? Yeah, that's true. And that's the story of the devastating 1916 Appalachian flood. Another story that makes up the history of this place we call home. Thanks for listening. Of course, pictures were hard to come by back then, but the great flood in 1916 in Western North Carolina, I've compiled some of the photos that I can find from historical sites, and I want to share those with you. So I'm going to put that up on green screen. Notice that the first few are Chimney Rock and Bat Cave, and if you look at them, you can see that the water patterns were similar back then to where it cut through than it is now. So here you see our paper. This is a well at Chimney Rock where everything eroded away behind it. These are Chimney Rock and Back Cave. Main Street Back Cave. Main Street Chimney Rock. This is Chimney Rock from, there's a rock called Devil's Head if you hike to the top. This is looking down. This is the old Fort Mountain railroad track. Then you'll just see some other pictures of different places in Western North Carolina. Some of these areas are around uh, Biltmore Village as well. And the very last, you should see the gate going into the Biltmore Estate. Brave men. Asheville grocery store.
that's the gate. To the Sorry for the youngins screaming in the background, they're playing, but um, some of those buildings were never built back, but the natives, just like they're doing now, pulled together and helped each other. And in all of the sadness, you see the love of the people helping each other and all the people from around that have brought in donations and they're volunteering. That is beautiful to see. And it may take a while and it's not gonna look the same, but we are going As a local family deals with heartbreaking destruction in the small town of Batcave, they have a first-hand reminder of a similar tragedy more than a century ago. It's all because of a letter found years earlier, and News 13's Karen Zakalai shares how it's helping the family get through this current crisis. Oh, my goodness. Ooh. Walking through a river. Okay. That's now receding. Across the rocks. These friends carry load by load of what's salvageable. Yeah, just trying to get some of my stuff because otherwise I have nothing, you know. Yasmin Prince's rental home is still standing, but the basement was totally flooded. All I can do is try to stay strong and positive, you know, um, so. We're thankful that Yasmin, that she's okay, and we're thankful that there's a lot of people around here that are okay because we know that. The constant roar of supply helicopters covers the emotion. The realization that this town lost a lot more than buildings and bridges. But for Nikki Barnett, her grandmother's home carried a much deeper connection. August the 7th, 1916, from Batcave, North Carolina. A letter linking today's grieving community with one from 108 years ago. I intended writing sooner, but have been busy. We have had a distressing time. Such rains and floods, the slides were something terrible. The water came in the house. It tumbled down while we were in it. We made our escape through the kitchen. We all ran out into the rain. Shirley Rhodes believes it was written by her grandmother's friend. It rained all night real hard. We couldn't get to anybody's house. The pages describe firsthand the flood of 1916 how that terrifying storm brought 22 inches of rain in one day, killing 50 people. Bud Ross's house was damaged. Edgar Huntley's wife and two children they were raising were swept away in a slide and killed. It details the difficult days and weeks that followed. We can't get out our horses and wagons out of here. Rose says she found the letter years ago, but it feels different reading it now. And it was just, you know, so heart-wrenching to hear what they went through and the damage, and then to see it replayed here in 2024. You know, nothing teaches you like your own circumstances and experiences, and um, you see so much that's similar. The letter giving us a glimpse back at the same winds and rains that tried to bury Batcave back in 1916, and then hit again two weeks ago. And it's just heart-wrenching to think of people that live in this area and have lost everything. The handwritten note also reminding us that this community did survive back then and will again. This community is amazing. Um, God is amazing and he's gonna get us through this. Karen Zadkalak, News 13. Manny. The only positive thing I gotta say, man, is, hey, that's these mountain people. And they taught me a lot. Because where I come from, people don't help us out like this, man. I mean, that's, you know, you're from the West Coast. People don't help us out like this. So you remember Irwin in that documentary on 1916?
want to get too close to the edge, but the ground caved in right here and the train tracks are just chilling. <laughs> Remember that photo from 1916 with the train tracks and the guy standing on it? I think we're gonna be fine. This is um, nuts to think about. We're up on this little hill, and we're about 30 feet up from the river. And uh, historically speaking, the most this river has ever flooded is 10 feet, which is probably close to what it's being <laughs> at now, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll be okay. I think we're going to be fine. I mean, show you, remember, remember the road? There was, there was this, wow. You can hear the sheer terror in Zoe Marlowe's voice as floodwaters from Helene came rushing into their Fairview home. What are you doing? Zoe filming as she, along with her two brothers, grabbed their family cat Pumpkin and tried to escape. She looked out the window and saw that the water was to the hoods of the cars. Water so high, they say it was safer to stay in their home. Because we couldn't go outside because the water was just too strong. Like, that had been instant death. Henry and Ian Marlowe, brothers of Zoe, who was back in school in Wilmington, the three triplets rode out Helene together in their home. One of the scariest moments when logs from a lumberyard behind the house crashed through the front door as feet of water rushed in. We just sat on the counters. The only thing that we could do was pray. And about 30 minutes later, the water started receding. I thought for, for about 10 minutes, I thought we were going to die. As the water receded, Wait, guys. Zoe continued to film their trek to safety. Once across the street from their property, they couldn't believe the devastation to their property. Several buildings that stored all of their dad's priceless antiques, gone. Right over there, that red thing was our gas pump. So my dad, he saved his gas pump and it's been completely destroyed. And our Texaco station was full of antique tools and shop supplies. Besides antiques, their vehicles trashed. Take a look at this video just down the road from the Marlowe's home. First, this home floating, swept off its foundation by the floodwaters. Then, there was Zoe's SUV floating away. As much devastation in here, it's just the blessings just keep on coming. One of those blessings, finding these pictures and toys. We found these all the way in that uh, cow pasture over there. These pictures show their brother Jason, who passed away as a child. These toys belong to him. The entire house is completely gone. We haven't been able to find hardly anything. These toys were the toys that he had played with when he was a kid. So these, these are, are like the, the most important, important thing to my dad at the moment. And this was all that we could say. Despite not saving much, surviving the storm together, the Marlowe triplets say it's brought them even closer. A lot of people's help, the community has helped out a lot. It's really been a blessing. Just kind of after everything had happened, I have my family. That's all that matters at the end of the day. Just thought I'd give you guys some perspective on how high the water rose, but this is the river down there, and it went over the bridge. There's the shipping containers. Stacked on top of each other. I'd give you guys some perspective on how high the coming for me. Oh, 
This is just somebody that came through with the uh, some clips of Guys, Hal Weatherman, Republican nominee for Lieutenant Governor uh, here in North Carolina. I'm in Chimney Rock, and um, wow, just complete devastation. We just came through Lake Lore, came up Lake Lore into Chimney Rock until it dead end. Show them. This is downtown Chimney Rock, the upper part. And the river has now been re-diverted. I mean, it, it's over in, in where the road used to be. And so that's where the, that used to take you up to Batcave, if people are familiar with this area. But uh, Chimney Rock's right here. Walk down here, we're gonna show you an example of the destruction. It's unbelievable. Show them. This is Bubba O'Leary's very iconic place in Chimney Rock for those of you who vacation here. Hey guys, Hal Weatherman, Republican. The building was built in 1927. Look at this. The water just came straight through. This is the pavilion. Here, strangely enough, like three years ago, um, I helped dedicate the pavilion that was right here. You can't see the pavilion, it's completely under all that, but I just talked to the town administrator. And uh, soon as part of the rebuild, kind of the relaunch of the rebuild, they're gonna dig out and show the seal because the seal is gonna be perfectly in place and intact down there. That's gonna be a very awesome moment when the town shows their seal still intact. So uh, watch the camera. Show the inside of the sport. It's unbelievable. That's the river, the base of the river down there. But I talked to Mr. O'Leary um, just a few minutes ago, and he said uh, they are going to rebuild. This building is completely salvageable. This one, don't know, but this one he said is salvageable, and they're going to do it. I also want to show you just to instill hope in people. We showed you the kind of the part of the town that was completely demolished. I'm not going to minimize this. This is pretty bad shape. But this side, people that are familiar with Chimney Rock, the part leading to Lake Lure on, on the right side, there's going to be a lot of salvageable buildings in here. And that's a good thing. So a lot of the iconic things that re you were used to. Coming forward to share his story after trying to rescue several employees of Impact Plastics. The driver, based out of Texas, has been following the tragedy in Irwin, Tennessee. News 5's Johnny Nordello spoke with him via Zoom today. On Friday, September 27th, truck driver Michael Dorsey was on a scheduled pickup near Impact Plastics in Irwin, Tennessee, when flash flooding in the area turned a routine stop into a tragedy. The water went from maybe two, three inches where we were to like almost covering my truck. Michael explains he was nearly finished loading up his truck when asked to evacuate, saying by then it was too late. When I pulled out of the driveway from uh, Duraline, they couldn't even make it down that road. They wouldn't have made it down that road in the car. 
So he never had a chance. In his attempt to leave, Michael saw several people standing in the water, one of which was Bertha Mendoza. He explains she frantically asked for his help. It was an older lady named Miss Bertha. She knocked on my door, and because the water had started to rise, looked like it was rising so fast, she was like, could they get on my trailer? So I let everybody get on my trailer. However, the water level continued to rise, trapping Michael and everyone on board the trailer. The pressure from the water got so strong that it capsized the uh, truck. And then once it capsized the truck, the truck um, broke loose from the trailer. And the trailer started to rise in the water. After capsizing, everyone fell into the rushing water. It was a strong current. The water was probably pushing, I'm going to say probably like 40 or 50 miles an hour. But it was like going white water rapid. Once he fell, Michael says he was holding on to Bertha Mendoza, but got hit in the head and lost consciousness, causing him to let go. He remembers the cold water caused him to quickly wake back up, but by then, she was already gone. The latest report stated Bertha Mendoza, along with four other employees on the trailer, are now confirmed dead. One is still unaccounted for. Once the news broke, Michael tells me he felt a sense of guilt. I told her I got her. I mean, I wasn't going to let nothing happen to her. And then by me getting hit upside the head by whatever hit me and I lost her, you know, it made me feel like I'm, I'm responsible. Saying he tried his best to help. I still have like visions and like nightmares about what happened. I mean, I tried to do what I could to help, but you can only do so much. Because of what happened, Impact Plastics is currently being investigated by TBI and TOSHA. Michael also wanted me to emphasize that his thoughts and prayers are with the families who lost loved ones. We went up to the house to see if we could make contact with the owners and we realized that those chickens were, looked like they were pretty hungry and there was, uh, their food was in that garbage can so we're getting them fed and getting the dog some water in the pen. I don't think he's eaten either. This is the river bank right here. You can see how high it must have got. Looks like maybe it knocked this. I don't know if that was down before, but it, this barn's all tore up. And I don't know what happened to the folks that were living here. Can you guys leave a note on the front? The, the date that we watered the dog and fed the chickens? Let's get them some water here in this bucket. Yeah, they got some. Yeah, you're gonna need more than that. Especially with as cold as it's fixing to get. They're going to go through a lot of water. Joe, can you figure out a way to get some water in there? Yep. Um, who was he? I want people to forget, like, months down the road. It's unrecognizable now. But this is where I was born and raised. The, the locals call it Craigtown because I'm, I'm a Craig and uh, a lot of my family still live over there. My dad was born and raised there. You know, my whole family's been in this tight-knit community. Um, but 11 people overall from this mudslide. We don't want people to forget like months down the road. Like this isn't just a, no, this is a week or two term. fix. This is, yeah. Um, we gotta be in it for a long haul. This is gonna take you know, years of work mm -hmm. repair. Mm -hmm. Our community and our town, I don't, I don't know that it's all right.
let them know around that time. Uh, the song is not getting the channel, uh, getting the video kicked off because copyright and all that stuff. But here's Bad Cave. And yeah, you know, like I said, I'm just posting this stuff because a lot of people probably haven't seen these. And I don't know what's, I mean, this is bigger than one person. This is going to take, like they said, years to do. And it's the, a lot of people going to need to put in action on it. There's nurses on horseback riding to the rescue. So, I mean, there you probably have seen videos of donkeys and things like that riding up the side of the mountains to get, uh, get supplies to. And this is uh, nurses doing the same thing. That car reminded me of the video. I couldn't find it, but there was a video of a car that had the, the back of the camera and you saw a mudslide going through the interstate, wiping out some cars. Richard Schaefer says the week has taxed them in a way no one has seen before. Some of the debris piles uh, that have washed down the rivers are the size of two-story homes. The dogs pair with the rescue teams, working their way around debris like this to pick up a scent of people missing or their remains. The total missing, state officials still don't know. There's still hundreds of people that we're getting reports um, are stranded. We traveled ourselves across a mountain dirt road to the edges of this washed out bridge along the North Toe River, where teams like this are searching. Family members tell me that they are still searching along this river today for a loved one that has gone missing since Hurricane Helene hit. Hope is growing thin. Out here, the silence of the stories not being told, or the ones we hear and we're asked not to share, it's hard to express. It, it's almost unspeakable. Thank you. 
Campbell says she's thankful to be alive after floodwaters left her stranded in her childhood home for hours with no way of knowing if help was on the way. I mean, I really thought I was just going to, you know, drown in my own house. Emily Russell says she was home alone early Friday morning when she found herself surrounded by water. I mean, it was literally like you were stuck on an island and I just didn't. I just didn't know what to do. There was no leaving the house at that point. Russell says she watched from her window as cars and RVs floated by. Then she heard part of the house collapse. When you start hearing that, it just, it's almost like a movie. It's just, and then the front door, the water pushed it in and it pushed in the back door. And within 30 seconds, it went from the ground to neck level. Russell says she and her dog floated on a mattress in her home for nearly eight hours, hoping to be rescued. It's like you go from this scariest feeling and place to almost peaceful because it was like you didn't, you were already so scared and your body's getting cold from being in the water and you know, you're getting sore from just shaking from being in the water and it's just like your body almost goes numb. And It wasn't until six in the evening when Russell's husband, David, was able to reach her. And the minute I seen him, it's just, I thought this is my only chance to get out. And so me and the dog took off down the front yard, but the currents were so strong that I only made it maybe 10 feet. and. I had to yell to them like I can't walk anymore or I'm, it's going to take me. Russell considers herself lucky. She made it out. She knows others weren't so fortunate. Russell says she doesn't know whether she or her husband have jobs to go to. And with the baby just weeks away, she doesn't know what they're going to do. In Swannanoa. Of a mudslide roaring down a mountain in Watauga County. It happens fast and it shows us just how quickly Helene became dangerous. This was in Sugar Grove. It was enough to knock a home off its foundation. WRL's Julian Grace spoke to the woman behind the camera. What you're witnessing here is a force of mud and water cascading down a hill in Sugar Grove. And just about everything in its path, it left covered. I'm okay. My car is gone. I'm okay. It's okay. The, the everything's gone. The voice you hear in this video is of Rachel Moshir. She's recording it all while gently reassuring her husband that everything will be all right. Well, I was outside videoing, you know, and it's a sheer coincidence that I got the mudslide on camera. Because obviously, you know, if I had expected there to be anything like that, I would have tried to get to a safer place. Let's take a look at what's left behind. The family sedan is trapped in mud. Home is badly damaged, but through it all, Moshir clings to her faith. Her family set up a GoFundMe to help recover what was lost and point people to organizations that are supporting the people of Western North Carolina. We still have food and we've got drinking water. Um, we still have one of our cars, so we have been able to get out and we've got shelter. I know our community as a whole, though, is hurting. Reporting in Raleigh, Julian Grace, WR. Tonight, recovery efforts across western North Carolina continue now 11 days after Helene devastated so many communities. One woman in Swannanoa is describing to us the moment she survived floodwaters by hanging on to a tree. Fox News' Carrie Beal is there now. And Carrie, this is just an incredible story of survival. Yeah, Justin, it's hard to imagine just how powerful and how high these waters were. Where I'm standing right now, this is by the Swannanoa River, they were over my head. And if you take a look behind us here, you can really see remnants of just how catastrophic these waters were. There's debris everywhere, there's a truck on its side, there's part of roofs that are in the water. And as a result, some are still dealing with the trauma and horror from that day. I haven't been able to get much sleep. Every pop, every noise, you know, it jumps. I jump. These are small reminders of what happened that Friday morning. Our trailer, this was probably about the front porch area. Her former home, now a dirt yard. This was another trailer. There was another trailer where that building was. And then our other friend right here, that's where that pile of rubble is. All of them gone, swept away during floodwaters from Helene. But that's not what haunts her from that tragic day. You can see his footprints on top of the roof right there on that one. One of our neighbors, we seen him in the back door of his trailer and he was hollering for help and we just kept telling him to climb a lot higher, you know, and he climbed on top of his trailer and 
it broke away and he was pinned against the apartments in his trailer. Just 100 yards away, another man watched as his neighbor was stranded. And there was a girl in the house over there who was yelling for help, but we couldn't get a hold of 911 and there was no way to get, get to her to get it because it was running down here too, too strong, the current. The water's wrath almost took Destiny and her husband. Current took us down to about right here. We got into a tree over here, but it ended up breaking away and we ended up floating on down to that tree over there. They held on to this tree for several hours until help arrived. Her arm was injured in the process. I just wish that we could have helped everybody else get out because they didn't deserve all that. They didn't deserve that at all. Fire chief says, I just want to know if fire chief says they are still searching through riverways and debris to try and find any missing citizens, but they could not tell us exactly how many right now are unaccounted for. So we'll keep you updated as we learn more about that situation. I'm up here right now in Little Creek Community in, is it Northwest Yancey County? Is that right up here? And uh, they have been with this storm completely cut off basically from the world. Uh, it was a tough drive and many detours and roads out to get up here. Uh, no, almost no way to get a truck up here at this point in time. And uh, they're looking right now, tell me Victoria what your electricity situation is. So the electric company has not even been able to get to us to um, determine a plan for power restoration. So what we are hearing is six months, but not to be surprised if it is beyond that. And you've got, uh, how many homes are up here? So we probably- Well, I'll tell you what, before you tell that, I know you got a neat story. Tell me what you're doing as far as generators, who's helping you out there? Just an FYI, right now it's about 30 degrees at night, low, maybe high 20s. They had snow up there in the mountains. The last couple of days, again, winter's coming. It gets really cold in those mountains. Uh, when the storm hit, it was warm. So uh, if you're a kid, you probably had a T-shirt on. And if you lost a home, you lost all your clothes because it's inside that home. So just think that most of these people that lost all their homes lost all their clothes. So if you have any way, that's one reason I'm making this, of helping out with clothing and things like that. Please, again, the links will be at the end here. I'll show you. And underneath in the show notes, send them, Amazon them, whatever. These guys need uh, a lot. Here's a friend Here's a friend of mine sent, introduced me to another friend of his who I actually talked to him the other day. Uh, he's in Swannanoa and... He's a Catholic, he's a convert, or revert, I'm sorry. Talked to him for about 15, 20 minutes. Not much I could say. I just listened because I mean, what can I say? Uh, but his home and business was completely destroyed. There were some photos that they sent. And one of the cool stories about this was this bench. It has a uh, engraving of St. Joseph. So says, St. Joseph, pray for me. It is said it weighs about 500 pounds, and they found it about 500 yards away from the house, and they had to travel over a bunch of mud and all that to get to uh, find out and find out what they could salvage from the house. They ended up getting a couple of guys to help out. It was him and his son, I think it was, and he found two other guys who were just looking around because there was looters out there, and he said he was going to pay them. He asked them, uh, what did he say? He was going to give him 50 bucks or something to help. Yeah, he offered $50 to help carry it. And one of the guys said, hey, no way. Maybe there is a God after all that if that thing's arrived. And they ended up helping him carry it back to his, uh, carry it back to his truck. Said about was a quarter mile away. See, another, my, my, it was my friend Jack who ended up hooking me up with the, the gentleman that sent me those photos about his business and home being destroyed. Anyway, this is from my man Jack in Swannanoa. So this is on the 14th. Still no water in most of the homes. So my friends in Black Mountain, Swannanoa, Asheville, Arden, Candler, 
uh, Fairview, etc. I have so many friends that have said individually that there was so, so many refrigerated truckloads of dead bodies that were shipped to Charlotte Identification Center. Uh, this is... Uh, I was in Black Mountain Swano last Sunday for church. The destruction is just unfathomable. The dust was horrible, still blowing it out of the day and a half later. Day and a half later. Now, he says uh, Swano Noah is pretty much destroyed. Here are some uh, photos of the snow just from, uh, what was this, two days ago? The, today is the 17th. So this was yesterday when I posted it. So, uh, yeah, so you think about these guys are camping out in their intents. Uh, there are they are intense uh, living out there. The guys that don't have homes anymore. So think about elderly uh, young kids. Again, usually they would be prepared for this by having their cold gear ready. But as a friend of mine, Judson Carroll, who let me get his website. He's so Judson runs this Southern Appalachian Herbs website. He also does a podcast, things like that. And one of his podcasts on the updating, uh, he mentioned that, he goes, yeah, I'm about as prepared as anybody you can think of. And when something like this happens, you can throw all that preparation out. Because you'll see people talking about getting MREs. I think there was a guy on Beck's show the other day talking about, he's with the Cajun Navy, saying, yeah, you have to get in those MREs and be able to, if your home gets swept away, you probably have the MREs inside the house. It, all that stuff goes thrown out the window. Now, if, you know, obviously, if you have some on top when you're there and your house doesn't get swept away, you, it works. Yeah. And like I said, Judson he ended up saying in his podcast that he's about as prepared as anybody. And he, even him, he wasn't prepared for something like this. And it's, I think it's just him. And he talks about being able to make it through a week and just soups. And the guy knows how what to eat outside and things like that. Situation like this, threw everything out the window. Here is the link I put together. Uh, parishes in North Carolina, <laughs> North Carolina, they're asking for donations and help in the local areas. Uh, I actually did, and I did speak to one of the parishes up there who basically said the stores in his area are stocked. The problem is that uh, people, some people don't have their cars anymore because you saw them floating down the river. Or if they don't have a car to go pick it up at, they don't have a home to bring it back to. If they don't have a home to bring it back to, or if they do have a home to bring it back to, they may not have a job to be able to pay for it in the future or may not be able to pay for anything as well. I mean, who knows how many people have cash stuck on them anymore these days. So he's asking, Father was asking if you just send the money to the parish and they'll be able to go out and get supplies and get it to the people. There are others. I'll show you a couple links. Well, I'll show you all the links right now just to give you an idea. Again, these will be in the show notes for you to help out on. Here's Hurricane Relief Fund for them. This is, what parish was this for? This was for our, uh, St. Barnabas and Arden. So it goes right to theirs. Here's St. Ant uh, Andrew and Sacred Heart. They give a list of things that you want, they're asking for. Again, if you just go to Amazon and you know, when you when you purchase it, here's the addresses. Send it to send it to one, send it to both, send it to you know as long as you send it to somebody. I mean, you just, I mean, from food, diapers, household stuff to big thing right now: generation generators, space heaters, tents, sleeping bags, clothing. St. Lucian and St. Bernadette, this is an Arden County, uh, Avery County, I'm sorry, just click the donate. St. Elizabeth Church, this is in Boone, uh, help out with them up there. St. Margaret Mary, Swannanoa. So, I mean, again, that's you've seen a couple of videos of what Swannanoa looks like. Uh, my man Jack, and he lives in that area. The the where you saw the photo about the St. Joseph's wood wood ship, uh, wood uh, wood table. He lives in that area. Uh, those guys got hit pretty hard. Uh, this church is okay. There's a little damage. I think the tree fell on it. I don't think there's any damage to the church, but uh, the people there are in trouble. Uh, but uh, again, well, you saw the videos. So anyway, thank you for watching. Again, it's the least I can do is put something up like this on the big channel to, you know, maybe drive more traffic. There's those, I'll have, you know, Martyrs Walk are doing great work up there, helping out uh, HS, HLDS. 
the homeschool group they're offering to help homeschoolers in the area. I'll have all the links underneath just to click on. So, you know, again, help out if you can.